Good night. We are quite proud to introduce uh, Francesca Bria, former Chief Technology Officer of Adocolau, and I think that the first women that pursue a digital agenda of uh, digital sovereignty in Barcelona. They moved from a smart city to a rebel city. Uh, they introduced a democracy mechanism through digital technologies. Uh, they also introduced a lot of uh, technicalities related to infrastructures, but mainly they politicized the digital technologies and they introduced a, a very interesting agenda on data commons and data sovereignty that Francesca is going to explain. Thanks for, for being here. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Sorry, I'm going to speak English, not Spanish, but uh, probably it's better. <laughs> My Spanish is very Italiano and it doesn't really help. <laughs> oh, should I just uh, talk? You can yes, start okay. I was, I was under the impression you were going to do questions. Yeah, That's what you uh, said. <laughs> yeah, okay. At the end, I after... thought it was going to be an interview. No? Yeah, well, uh, we can in, you, you can start talking if you want about the, the, the agenda that you pursue on a technical level. Uh, okay, so now, shall I start first... with what we've done in Barcelona? Yeah. Yeah, so yes, so as uh, Ekaitz uh, just said, I used to be a commissioner uh, for technology and digital innovation of the city of Barcelona. And this was something that um, basically Ada Colau uh, decided to uh, that it was very important to align the technology agenda with the rebel city agenda that Barcelona pursued in the first mandate uh, when she became mayor. And as you all know, I mean, that was a social movement that brought Ada to power. She is the first woman uh, mayor in Barcelona with a very strong social agenda. And we knew that to become uh, a digital city and a smart city, it was not at all about technology. So we didn't want to fall into the trap of a smart city as a technology-led, top-down uh, agenda implemented by the big tech, where you basically were going to give the ownership of the critical infrastructure of the future, connectivity, data, sensors, and also citizens' life information about what is good, what's happening in the city to the big tech, actually selling this data and infrastructure twice, because as citizens, we pay for the services, for the public services. But in this case, we pay once for the public services, and then we pay twice giving our data to the big tech, because as we know, the business model of the digital economy today is based on the manipulation and the monetization of personal information and data. But let me start to explain a little bit why we wanted to pursue an agenda that was based really on citizens' participation, on data democracy, and in particular on putting technology at the service of people, at the service of the green transition, at the service of the agenda that Ada Colau was implementing in Barcelona. First of all is because we know that this is not about technology. This is about reshaping, first, reshaping the relationship between citizens and their government. So it was really about democratic legitimacy that, as we know, it was very much under threat, in particular during the Indignados movement, after the you know, first uh, financial crash and the political legitimacy, I mean, the legitimacy of the political class was very uh, minimal. So it was about uh, really reshaping this democratic relationship between the public sector and the citizens and making sure that we could change politics by bringing in citizens in the decision making process. So the DNA of the Barcelona experiment was about reshaping participatory democracy. And as we know, because I'm sure you are familiar with one of the actual largest experiments in the world about participatory democracy, this, although we used a lot of technological tools and infrastructures, this was not at all about click here to change the world. I mean, we really refused technological solutionism as an ideology, which was imposed by Silicon Valley and which technological solutionism basically also tell us 
that you know you just need an app or you just need to introduce some technology in order to solve complex problems like access to housing, like uh, poverty, like climate change. So we knew that this was absolutely not the case, and um, and that you actually we needed to have a hybrid of a participatory process between offline. So we spent like almost one year of the first mandate of Ada Colau shaping a large scale participatory movement where, you know, people were going in the streets, doing citizen assemblies and consulting citizens on the main decisions that the government was taking. And then we developed the platform that you all know, which is called Decid in Barcelona. It's open source, uh, the data is secure, and in particular, it's the property of the citizens of Barcelona. It is managed and developed as a public good, as a common good, and it is owned by the community itself that is also now developing it because Barcelona Decidim that was used uh, in the first mandate of Ada Colau, and now it's still in use in Barcelona. It is now a platform that is used by 120 cities around the world. More than 80 countries are using it. So this also shows that this kind of local experiments can scale. They work on a larger, larger dimension. And so we started from this hybrid of online democracy and offline democracy. I mean, overall, we track that it's more than 500,000 citizens of Barcelona participated in the policymaking process of the city. More than 70% of the proposals that became the action plan of the city of Barcelona came directly from citizens. I mean, this is really uh, impressive uh, because you, you know we know that one of the problem of policymaking is that it's opaque, that it's just made by experts, that you know it's very hard to integrate the collective intelligence of citizens in the decision making process. Then, having said that, we also did something more. So we wanted to move, as I said, away from a paradigm of a smart city controlled by big tech and the model of surveillance capitalism based on you know, uh, only few players that are monetizing and selling citizen data in exchange of free services to a model of, um, of data sovereignty and technological sovereignty. By technological sovereignty, I wanna be very clear here what we mean. So first of all, we mean that today technological sovereignty also means political and economic sovereignty. It's, it's, it's impossible to have a political sovereignty and an economic sovereignty if you do not have a technological sovereignty. Um, for many different reasons, I mean, because technological sovereignty means, uh, I mean, it also in involves national security, economic competitiveness, a new geopolitical dimension, which is very strong today that we are facing you know, now talking like geopolitical, a battle for technological supremacy between the two biggest economies of the world, the US on one side, with a kind of big tech model led by Silicon Valley, and China on the other side with a kind of big state model where they have a very centralized control, in particular of citizen data, and of course economic and political power very much centralized in the, in the Communist Party of China. So we have these two models and, you know, our ambitions, I mean, even you, you think, can you really propose an alternative from a city level? Well, the ambition was to propose another way, which is basically not the big tech, not the big state, but the big democracy. So devolving power to the citizens, engage them in a process of participatory democracy, but also making sure that critical infrastructures of the future 5G, connectivity, data, artificial intelligence can be conceived as a public good. And in particular, the question of data, I think is very important because today, well, we know that data is the raw material of the digital economy. And um, I mean, we see a market value of these big tech companies, which business model is based on accumulating and aggregating data with artificial intelligence engines is basically, you know, 7 trillion US dollars. They run the market, they control the market. We are facing a, a kind of very big problem when, when, when we talk about uh, corporate monopoly power and basically decentralizing this data, but in particular, I'm proposing a new governance model, a new property regime for data that claims back 
people control over a critical material and the critical infrastructure of our time, for us, it was particularly important. Also, because if you use this technological infrastructure and data to serve people, you can really put it at the service of the political program of the city of Barcelona. So regaining sovereignty, sovereignty means that you can leverage this power that you have to solve the question of, you know, to have more affordable housing, sustainable mobility, fight against climate change, renewable energy, rethinking the production model, and rethinking the future of the city. So, uh, so this is very important to understand, also because, like, I have to be very concrete here. For instance, Ada, she's not like a technological geek. I mean, I've been working in this field for many years, so for me, you know, this question of technological sovereignty and what to do with data to reclaim it back as a public good has been always very important because I understand the political um, power that this program has. But for instance, Ada understood it in a different way. She understood it because this has a very strong impact on the policy of the city. Let's think about Airbnb. On a certain point, when you understand that these big platforms come to your city and they have a very strong impact on the house on the price of housing, basically halting your agenda of affordable housing because it's not possible anymore. You have more evictions. People cannot afford to pay their homes. People are removed from the city center. So you see all these phenomena. And also you go there and you ask Airbnb, can we see how you are affecting the price of housing in our city? It was impossible because we did not have access to the data of the platform. And we could not know, you know, what is the impact of this mis business model on, on this very fundamental thing, which is our policy of affordable housing. So take Uber. How is Uber affecting public transportation in a city, big time. So we have seen big conflict over public transport. If we now we have the imperative of moving towards the ecological transition, a big issue is going to be public integrated green and electric mobility. How are we going to implement a smart grid, electrifying all our infrastructure, monitoring the data so that we, we, we are able to provide a kind of public transportation system that people expect from, of, of the quality of Uber if we do not have access to that data. And how can we fight platform monopolies such as, you know, <laughs> these big companies, but also such as platforms like Airbnb and Uber, if we are not able to understand it and if we are not able to basically set some condition on how they do the business in our city. So in practice, what we've, we have done with the question of data are two main things. The first thing is that we change the public procurement contracts of the city of Barcelona. So as we know, public procurement is a big issue for all public sector. This is what governments do. They take public, public citizen money and they invest it to buy services and infrastructures. So what we've done is we int have introduced um, data sovereignty clauses in public procurement contracts. I mean, we have also introduced open source clauses. We have mandated for ethical digital standards, for interoperability, for ethics and security by design in the service we develop. But the question of data sovereignty, I want to explain. So by putting these clauses in the contract, what it means is that today, no matter what the city of Barcelona is contracting in a public procurement process, it can be the telephone contract, the telecom contract, or it can be the mobility or the transport service, or it can be the waste management contract or the lighting of the city. There is a clause that says that whoever wins the, the bid has to give back to the city of Barcelona the data in machine readable format. So this data can be consumed by artificial intelligence engine. And this data is considered a public infrastructure, a common good on top of which you can use, I mean, on top of which you can build artificial intelligence um, modeling, you can build new services, uh, you know, to fight climate change, to improve mobility, for better education system, education tools, whatever it is, new services based on this data, which is a public good that belongs to the citizens of Barcelona. 
On top of that, we even went be, be, be beyond that. I mean, of course, I have to say, I don't know, Ikaits, how much you want to go into the details of this program, but of course, I mean, transforming government digitally means creating new skills, hiring new people. In Barcelona, I've hired 65 people. Uh, many of them came from, uh, you know, younger, much younger, uh, with new skills coming from technical universities, some, some with data science skills, of course, that you cannot find in the administration today. So you need a new capacity, like a smart bureaucracy to transform government. Uh, but having said that, um, you know, now with that data, we are also able to mobilize, you know, to, to, to do many more things, to take better decisions about the management of the city, uh, to, to, to run the city more in real time. Uh, so we, we gain the critical know-how, the critical, you know, knowledge and the critical also assets, because this is economic, has a lot of economic value. So we show that you can mobilize data, not only for private profits, you know, to, uh, to do advertising, to do political targeting, uh, to improve the services of the big tech, but you can use it to create public value, to improve the city, to make it greener, to make it more, um, you know, more uh, to, yeah, to make it more accessible to everybody. So you can really transform uh, the city uh, by, uh, by having this kind of approach. And of course, um, then we created the Decode project that maybe many of you know, which was also going a bit beyond that. And we said, okay, let's really experiment giving even more control to the citizens because many citizens don't really want this data just be owned by governments or by the big companies, but they want to be like in control themselves. And the Decode project is um, basically uh, created tools that are decentralized, privacy enhancing with strong cryptography and that allows citizens to decide what data they want to keep private, what data they want to share, with whom and on what term. So this is what we call a new social pact on data, a new citizens pact on, pact on data where we give back the value uh, to, the, to the people. So we create public value through data using decentralized and privacy enhancing technology. Uh, just let me close maybe here, because of course we can say a lot of things about what we've done in Barcelona by saying that, of course, you know, also uh, having the possibility of creating some understanding about the importance on, of linking technology, economics and politics to make it a political issue, to reclaim data sovereignty as a central political issue of our time because we know that who is going to control data and artificial intelligence and the infrastructures underlying that will set the rules, will set the new institutions of our society. It is not about technology. It is about who is going to control education, who is going to control, you know, the transportation, uh, the mobility of our cities, our cities themselves. I mean, this is changing the way government operates. So it is really having to do with our welfare state. It's having to do with our political model, because do we want a digital society that has fundamental rights of citizens at the very core, data sovereignty, citizens participation, workers' rights, environmental rights? Do we want to mobilize technology and data at the service of the green transition and the ecological transition to fight the main problem of our time, which is climate change, or do we want con to continue to, you know, to have this critical infrastructure and services exploited under the model of the big tech that concentrate industrial and social power in a way that we have never seen in the history of humanity? And, you know, they're going to be posing a lot of big political questions like antitrust, like taxation, how are we gonna tax these companies? I mean, now these are the topics that are discussed at the, at the European level. What model of antitrust do we need? Do we need to break these companies because they are so powerful that they're buying all the, you know, all the small companies in particular to get access to the data so that they can then, you know, prototype new services that are based on our healthcare data, on our more private use of data. How are we going to tax these companies? And in particular, 
Is Europe going to be able to have in its own industrial strategy where we build our own technological industry, we build our own capacity to manage data, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and all the critical infrastructure of the future. And so we can also imagine an alternative business model that's based on socializing these critical assets, that's based also on including much more people and on creating public value. So I think these are the fundamental questions that we need to ask. And to come back to the, to the, to, to the issue of, um, can it really a local experiment done in a city show Europe or to the world what needs to be done? I think yes, because the problem is also to put these ideas into practice, to give power to communities, to give power to the people and to the citizens so that they can experiment alternative models with these with this, um, technological infrastructures. And, and then to put pressure so that these models can scale up at a European level where of course, I mean, we need this European level at least, and in particular now after the pandemic with the next generation EU and the recovery fund, we have to be able to direct all this investment into building this alternative capacity of society. Because otherwise Europe will become a digital colony, which is basically a sandwich between the big state of China on one side and their technology champions, and the big tech of Silicon Valley on the other side with the, with the data monopolies. And so we need to regain our technological sovereignty, which as I said at the beginning also means political, economic and geopolitical sovereignty, and then you know, put forward those kind of alternatives. And I think that the network of cities, which are empowering citizens and you know, developing these services for the green transition, for ac ac uh, like affordable housing, to solve concrete problem of citizens, and they're showing how this can be done are the places to start. So let's start from a network of rebel cities that put you know, technological sovereignty, ethical digital standards, citizens participation at the very center, and then let's scale it up as a European program that we can put forward um, right now. Francesca, I, I mean, as a city, uh, I guess you experimented some some limits uh, because of the lack of power of the state uh, in Spain. We, we are seeing right now in the context of the coronavirus, uh, we are seeing like telephonic Iberdrola pursuing very, very, uh, uh, very straightforward agenda on smart cities, uh, disempowering all the public services. Uh, uh, which were the limits uh, that you saw uh, on the city level? And... Uh, which should be uh, your, in your ideal scenario, the role of the state or what, what are you doing there in, in Italy right now? Uh, I mean, you, you have some money to invest. That's the way, uh, having, that, uh, having that money, uh, you, you mm -hmm. told something that was very interesting, uh, public money, public code, and you established a rule like 75% or something like that yeah. of the public money should be invested on open software technologies. Yes. It's that a kind of approach uh, that can be yeah. scaled up on a state level. Uh, what yeah. could, could be done? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So thanks for reminding that. Maybe I didn't say it very clearly because I focus a lot on uh, uh, data sovereignty, but we also had a very strong open source uh, policy, open standards, interoperability, all of that. And in fact, we had in our policies that 80% of the investment of the city of Barcelona in IT had to be in open source, in free software and in open standards. And this is something that the team now is continuing. I mean, this is not easy because of course of the reliance of this uh, uh, type of proprietary infrastructure in government is very strong. I have to say that also the lobbying of these companies is very strong. So if I have to say what is the main obstacle at the beginning, it was exactly this lobby lobbying power. And this lobbying power is not only the lobbying that they do on a day to day, but it's also the ideology around digital. So many people talk about the digital as it is something neutral, as it is something absolutely non-political. So now even with the recovery plan, you know, 140 billion, I mean, 20% of the recovery fund are going to be going into digital. And it's very important that we politicize the question of technology here. 
what it what it means you know when our education system is going to be digital what it means when our healthcare system is going to be digital who is going to run the critical infrastructure in cities who is going to own the data what kind of economic and business model we have regarding the data and the diffusion of innovation in our society these are big political questions what is the role of europe in this geopolitical um moment where you know we really see a big fight due to who is going to control the microprocessor the artificial intelligence and the quantum computing of the future this is not technology this is going to be across the whole industrial sector automotive agritech space technology uh like everything it's going to be affected by this fundamental fight so we need to have a discourse also on the left about what we need to do moving forward uh, but go, so going back, so so the question of also this ideological um, kind of, uh, you know, a barrier that of course is very hard to talk about technology in this explicit political way, we need to get rid of that. And then, uh, well, the lobbying is very strong also because we lack uh, alternatives. So we have a lot of open source alternatives. We have a lot of work that has been done in communities, in civil society, also lots of startups that at the moment are creating alternatives, but they're not strong enough. So we need a lot of public investments, also public investments in research, like basic research, uh, research and development in human capital, in education, in science. So this is a big part of uh, public policy. And then we need to accelerate uh, economic models that are beneficial, which have environmental and social impact that we can measure and they're beneficial to society and that respect fundamental rights of citizens, workers and the environment. I mean, this is all really to be integrated in clauses, as I said before, in public procurement contracts. I mean, this is a little bit like the conversation we have for the bailout of the pandemics. Are we only bailing out the companies, just giving them money? Or are we helping to transform the business model? So say that you need, you need to have target for decarbonization. You need to pay taxes in Europe. You cannot put your money in, uh, no, in the fiscal paradise. This is the same conversation. Are we just giving money to the big tech, which actually are non-European because we lack alternatives. So I said, we need an industrial, I mean, the industrial policy of the future is going to be about these things. Actually, it's not of the future, it's of the present. But, you know, when we give money, are we implementing data sovereignty clauses with standards? Are we implementing, you know, open source and in the procurement process? Are we implementing interoperability and the kind of sovereignty of data? All these things are, they have to be in and they are political choices, of course. And then, uh, so, so just to say the obstacles are also that in the, Poli I mean, in politics, people that have this kind of responsibility, we have a very low consciousness about these topics and understanding. So a lot of the work has been also kind of um, uh, explaining the importance and explaining what it is behind and explaining why things have to be done in a different way and why they are connected with the fundamental things why people are fighting for. Uh, you know, affordable housing, energy sovereignty, energy poverty, uh, who is controlling public space in cities, um, better workers' conditions. I mean, all of these things are part of the same agenda. And it's time that, you know, we, we recognize that this is uh, the case. Um, yeah, so these are the big obstacles. Fantastic. There was something that you mentioned before, but was very interesting, the kind of governance approach uh, with firms, with the industry, uh, so in this ideal approach and this scenario, uh, which is the relation between the data that it's also from citizens, but how it goes, how it flows uh, to the industry, how it helps yeah. create a kind of a local ecosystem of startups, uh, not followed by the neoliberal logic of internet entrepreneurship, but with another kind of approach. Uh, where these businesses can take uh, advantage of this data, they can pay a minimum quota or something yeah. or a minimum tax to use it. Yeah. So this industrial uh, policy yeah. on a local level, how it works, because it's interesting. Yeah. When you I mean, not, not only on a local level. Uh, I mean, I think here it has to be implemented on a European scale. I mean, I think the first thing is obviously to reclaim some governance and some sovereignty over this data. So now Europe is investing in Gaia X, which is the European cloud infrastructure. 
I think it's a good step, maybe a bit late, maybe a bit too late, but let's see, maybe not. Uh, but anyways, I think um, let's see how this is going to be done. But the idea is also to create a golden standard for data security, data ethics and interoperability so that the data you know, stays in Europe and in particular, it stays with also the companies because I mean, there is of course the personal and private data that we produce and this has to be governed by citizens themselves. Uh, through decentralized technology, through cryptography, through rights to data, which we have enforced by the GDPR because we have the most advanced regulation on the planet on these kind of things. But we have also the industrial data. And this is important that we keep the industrial data in Europe for the European companies. And the Internet of Things industrial data are going to be mixed between personal data and industry data. So now, for instance, the European Commission has released the Data Governance Act, has released the, the Digital Market Act, the uh, Digital Service Act, and then there is going to be the Data Act uh, early next year. So we will have a corpus, like a, a big uh, framework of new laws that we are going to have to study in depth. But basically, one point that is very important is that, um, you know, the big platforms are, are going to be mandated to share data with rivals. This is also, I mean, in a different context, non-market context, because that's also what you're asking me, what about for the public good? So there is regulating the market in a kind of competition terms, but there is also leveraging and using data for the public good and for citizens good. And how do you do that? I mean, also sharing, forcing these companies to share data for the public interest, data that is in the public interest. So there was a very interest, interesting um, French law. I mean, this is what we have been experimenting in Barcelona with public procurement. It will be good to move out also, not only for public procurement, but an agreement that you do with all the platforms. Now I'm in relationship with the city of Hamburg that what, wants to experiment something similar. So maybe we will release the first law at the city level that does something like that. Because it is important to understand that for us, it is not only about privacy. So it is about privacy, information, self-determination, people autonomy, and you know our rights over data, which is very important, but it is also the creation of public value, which is very important. Uh, so we want people to be able to share it as a public infrastructure, as a public good, but to share it, to improve the city, to improve services, to create innovation. So you can give access to local companies, to journalists, to NGOs, to citizens, to use this data to create new knowledge projects, you know, because this is what we need. We need this data to, you know, to, to serve a purpose of improving something or using it with different logic, as you're saying. So not only for profitability, but also to do something you know, that uh, just benefits society. So, so, so these are all options that are on the table and can be done. So they can be done through also policy tools. But of course, I mean, as you know, I mean, Evgeny has been speaking here um, in the opening session. These are highly political questions. So we, we, we have to know that we can act. So this is my message. So the situation is what it is, is very, you know, we have a corporate monopoly power, Europe is a little bit out of the story. Uh, we have to get back into, you know, focusing on this issue as a core political question, but we can do a lot. We can experiment a lot also at the city level, at the community level, but we need to be aware that these are big issues and also that we, we need to experiment also with different, uh, I mean, economic models. And so these are, these, are, these are also bigger theoretical questions and bigger political questions that we're going to have to face. I know, uh, yeah, the, the explanation that Evgeny gave us, <laughs> yeah. gave us was quite theoretical and abstract, but basically uh, was based on an idea, uh, like apart from the uh, startup nation, apart from all this entrepreneurship uh, propaganda, mm -hmm. we have like an an innovation and a discovery process uh, that it's under this way. So changing the paradigm of mode of production to mode of discovery, but uh, this needs in the end, 
policy it's, purpose, and it's a public infrastructure that it's against the private monopolies. So, uh, yeah. is this something? Uh, these public infrastructures should be built not just on a city level, not yet on a, on a state yeah. level. Should we need At a, a European level. kind of pan-European approach yes. uh, that can also uh, change the narrative of the European integrations, integration that was underway yeah. during the last year. Is this a way of uh, uh, abandoning this kind of free market approach to Europe mm -hmm. so we can yes. uh, uh, try to develop another epistemic or another kind of Mm -hmm. uh, understanding, cultural understanding of Europe. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that due to the pandemic, but also due to structure of condition, changes in geopolitical relationship between the US and China, uh, changing in the global trade regimes, uh, question over, uh, you know, failures of globalization, uh, questions, uh, failures of globalization that also mean that a lot of countries are talking about reshoring back some of the big in industrial um, assets that were, you know, just uh, uh, basically offshore to Asia. Uh, also due to automation and artificial intelligence that will move profits more and more uh, to the companies and the nations that own this kind of infrastructure and uh, the artificial intelligence. So we risk of having a big impact on the labor condition and the dignity of work that we have to preserve. I mean, we see this in our society with the gig economy. I mean, how much we have to fight against precarization of labor and the gig economy is really a big challenge because you know we need to reestablish uh, fundamental rights of workers <laughs> in this kind of gig economy uh, but also uh, I would say because of the industrial concentration of power I mean look I was quite struck I mean now today you have five companies owning the market they are not just driving the market they are the market I mean the big tech today 20 percent of the stock market evaluation I mean, this is huge. We are talking about, you know, such a strong uh, industrial concentration. These are companies that invest 15 to 20 billion per year in infrastructure. And these infrastructures is mainly cloud computing, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, microprocessors, and so on. So this is a big challenge. You cannot do it as a nation alone. We need a pan-European approach for the level of ambition in investments, in industrial strategy, but also in finding a new regulatory framework and also in reclaiming back the center, which is democracy. I mean, which is society participation, which is workers' rights, which is people rights and people fundamental rights and values, which is part of why we built Europe in the first place. So for me, these things, um, we can only do it with a pan-European approach and I want to say that we can have an approach uh, to data and to part of this infrastructure, which is public good. So it has to be a public infrastructure where the state invest, but also really own it because this is a strategic asset. This is also about national security. And this is also, you know, this is a very strong, the need I think to have a democratic control. But on top of that, I think we, we need to have hybrid models. We do need to have startups. We do need to have public and private investments. We need to have civil society experimenting with technology in a completely different form, like the libraries, like the post office, but of the new kind. This cannot only be a centralized state-driven approach. This is impossible. This is not working. And also we need to leverage the capacity of research centers, of, um, of, you know, of uh, universities, but also of the new kind of innovation, like really, I mean, also, you know, the, 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 the kind of experiments that are out there, you need to also look at that. So you need a new approach that has to be pan-European, but it has to be something new, which is not going to be how we built the Airbus or how we built, you know, trains. It has to be different. And that's why we need a new industrial policy and we have to rethink it for the digital age. And I think it's going to be very central to how we rebuild Europe. We still have a minute and you mentioned something interesting before uh, when it comes to uh, welfare uh, on the European social uh, pact or a kind of a, or something like that. But you, you wrote an article uh, like criticizing the neoliberal vision to basic income and uh, you argue mm. that could be an interesting approach uh, for the radical left. How this uh, mm. 
change of on the on the world of work uh, that moves from Fordism to a kind of digital Taylorism. How can mm -hmm. uh, the old concept of worker <laughs> can be redesigned yeah. and use this uh, use this benefits that we have from artificial intelligence, yes. finance, basic income, or something that in the material level uh, can impact the citizens? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I think this is at the core of rethinking this paradigm. Um, I have to say that this is also very linked to the conversation about we've seen an increased precarization of labor uh, over the last uh, 20, 30 years, obviously linked to, uh, as you say, to neoliberal policies, uh, to actually the regulation of the labor market as such. Uh, but also to the concentration of, uh, I mean, financialization and the concentration of industrial power that we have seen. And it is going to increase. I mean, many economists say that this is going to increase. Of course, there is a big debate. Are the work are going to disappear with automation? Are they going to be removed? Are they just changing? But anyway, it's changing radically. So it will also be different how we capture and create value. That's for sure. Uh, but I think what I do not want to do only, so now there is a lot of fights, for instance, against, um, you know, Amazon uh, due to the exploitation of labor. I mean, there was this strike during Christmas. I mean, we have to also consider that these companies during the pandemic, for all of us, this was a shock. For them, this was a positive shock. So the stock value skyrocketed, they became much richer, their market power increased. And obviously this does doesn't trickle down to the workers, the workers have less rights. So we are seeing a big movement there against the exploitation of labor and against precarization of the entire um, sector. But I think we have to go beyond redistributing. We have to be you know, fighting on the top of how this value is actually created. So we also need to be having an influence on how these industrial policies are set because we do need to change the business model here, I think pretty strongly. And so we have to maybe go back to this idea of, um, I mean, because you asked me also before about neoliberal Europe and so on. During the pandemics, we are seeing also how we suspending um, state aid uh, states are entering into the states. I mean, they are taking equity inside the main uh, strategic companies. They are blocking foreign acquisitions of strategic technologies like artificial intelligence and biotech. This is not only happening between the US and China. This is happening in Europe. I mean, Germany today, uh, two days ago blocked the Chinese acquisition of a biotech company, which now is very strategic because of the vaccine and so on. And is a sector that's growing a lot. So the state is very active into shaping the industrial policy and the economic policy. And this is something that is good. It is important to continue to do that and to shape that. Uh, so why am I, am, am I saying this responding to the, to the uh, basic income? Because this is the most important thing, understanding how you can shape and set the condition on the industrial policy front, on the creation of wealth, and then on the redistribution of wealth as well. And then, you know, also understanding that the basic income, it's not about cash transfer and reducing the role of the state in the economy, is rethinking the role of state in the economy in terms of quality, not only quantity, like, you know, directing more and shaping the market and so on. And also then rethinking the welfare state. So, you know, in the neoliberal framework, the basic income is just cash transfer, and then we get rid of public health care, we get rid of public schools, we get rid of a lot of conquest, con not, um, uh, the core of the, of the welfare state of Europe. So no, we have to strengthen public, like, you know, the, the public welfare system, the infrastructure of it, and then we, we, we can have a, a, a basic income as a remuneration of the collective uh, value creation that we do all the time, putting also you know, reproductive work and care work and the role of women at the very center, which is something very important also uh, to rethink this economic model. No digital revolution without feminist revolution. Uh, <laughs> this is absolutely yeah. yes. We Quite have to close thing. with this that a, a digital revolution yeah. has to be also a feminist revolution. Absolutely yes, exactly. So uh, we have we don't have more time. Uh, and uh, just to conclude, because you touch a very important point, we're going to finish now about also this digital money 
I mean, let's also, we are touching a lot of core infrastructure of the state, you know, the welfare, the education, the healthcare system is going to be the next, that's going to be absolutely the core market of the big tech and the identity and the personal data is already gone. And now we have the question of who is going to control the digital money. And we have this skyrocketing evaluation of Bitcoin. We have central banks coming in to try and regulate digital money. I mean, this is going to be important to have a public infrastructure for digital money and take back the sovereignty of our data and rebuild the foundation of the institution of our future, which is healthcare, education, our citizens, and so on. I mean, this is the core of the conversation. Okay, so now uh, we don't have more time now. Uh, Finished. Thanks, Francesca. Uh, Thank you. You gave us a lot of ideas to think on, to discuss here in Spain that we need them because there are no, there's no a big debate. Uh, we try this with these conferences. Hope it's good enough for thinking, food for thought. So thanks for your time. And cool. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye and bye to all the Spanish people. <laughs> <laughs> Adios. Gracias. Agur. Muchas gracias. Adeo. <laughs> Ciao.